Mr. McCoy here with a brand new tale, Number the Stars. Ten-year-old Anne-Marie Johansson and her best friend Ellen Rosen often think about life before the war. But it's now 1943 and their life in Copenhagen is filled with school, food shortages, and the Nazi soldiers marching in their town. The Nazis won't stop. The Jews of Denmark are being relocated, so Ellen moves in with the Johansons and pretends to be a part of the family. Then Anne-Marie is asked to go on a dangerous mission. Somehow she must find the strength and courage to save her best friend's life. There's no turning back now. And so begins Number the Stars. I'll race you to the corner, Ellen. Anne-Marie adjusted the thick leather pack on her back so that her school books balanced evenly. Ready? She looked at her best friend. Ellen made a face. No, she said laughing. You know I can't beat you. My legs aren't as long. Can't we just walk like civilized people? She was a stocky ten-year-old, unlike lanky Anne-Marie. We have to practice for the athletic meet on Friday. I know I'm going to win the girls' race this week. I was second last week, but I've been practicing every day. Come on, Ellen, Anne-Marie pleaded, eyeing the distance to the next corner of the Copenhagen Street. Please... Ellen hesitated, then nodded and shifted her own rucksack of books against her shoulders. Oh, all right. Ready, she said. Go, shouted Anne-Marie, and the two girls were off, racing along the residential sidewalk. Anne-Marie's silvery blonde hair flew behind her, and Ellen's dark pigtails bounced against her shoulders. Wait for me, wailed little Kirsty, left behind, but the two older girls weren't listening. Anne-Marie outdistanced her friend quickly, even though one of her shoes came untied as she sped along the street called Oster Brocade, past the small shops and cafes of her neighborhood here in northeast Copenhagen. Laughing, she skirted an elderly lady in black who carried a shopping bag made of string. A young woman pushing a baby in a carriage moved aside to make way. The corner was just ahead. Anne-Marie looked up, panting, just as she reached the corner, Her laughter stopped. Her heart seemed to skip a beat. Halt! The soldier ordered in a stern voice. The German word was as familiar as it was frightening. Anne-Marie had heard it often enough before, but it had never been directed at her until now. Behind her, Ellen also slowed and stopped. Far back, little Kirsty was plodding along, her face in a pout because the girls hadn't waited for her. And Marie stared up. There were two of them. That meant two helmets, two sets of cold eyes glaring at her, and four tall, shiny boots planted firmly on the sidewalk, blocking her path to home. And it meant two rifles gripped in the hands of the soldiers. She stared at the rifles first. Then, finally, she looked into the face of the soldier who had ordered her to halt. Why are you running? The harsh voice asked. His Danish was very poor. Three years, Anne-Marie thought with contempt. Three years they've been in our country and still can't speak the language. Uh, I was racing with my friend, she answered politely. We have races at school every Friday, and I want to do well, so I... Her voice trailed away, the sentence unfinished. Don't talk so much, she told herself. Just answer them, that's all. She glanced back. Ellen was motionless on the sidewalk, a few yards behind her. Farther back, Kirsty was still sulking and walking slowly toward the corner. Nearby, a woman had come to the doorway of a shop and was standing silently, watching. One of the soldiers, the taller one, moved toward her. Anne-Marie recognized him as the one she and Ellen always called, in whispers, the giraffe because of his height and the long neck that extended from his stiff collar. He and his partner were always on the corner. He prodded the corner of her backpack with the stock of his rifle. Anne Marie trembled. What is in here? he asked loudly. From the corner of her eye she saw the shopkeeper move quietly back into the shadows of the doorway, out of sight. School books, she answered truthfully. Are you a good student? The soldier asked. He seemed to be sneering. Yes. What is your name? Anne-Marie Johansson. 
your friend, is she a good student too? She was looking beyond her at Ellen, who hadn't moved. Anne-Marie looked back too and saw that Ellen's face, usually rosy-cheeked, was pale and her dark eyes were wide. She nodded at the soldier. Better than I am, she said. What is her name? Ellen. And who is this? he asked, looking to Anne-Marie's side. Kirsty had appeared there suddenly, scowling at everyone. Uh, my little sister. She reached down for Kirsty's hand, but Kirsty, always stubborn, refused it and put her hands on her hips defiantly. The soldier reached down and stroked her little sister's short, tangled curls. Stand still, Kirsty. Marie ordered silently, praying that somehow the obstinate five-year-old would receive the message. But Kirsty reached up and pushed the soldier's hand away. Don't, she said loudly. What do you think the soldiers will do now? Share with your fellow listener. Both soldiers began to laugh. They spoke to each other in rapid German that Anne-Marie couldn't understand. She is pretty like my own little girl, the tall one said in a more pleasant voice. Anne-Marie tried to smile politely. Go home, all of you. Go study your school books and don't run. You look like hoodlums when you run. The two soldiers were turned away, turned away. Quickly, Anne-Marie reached down again and grabbed her sister's hand before Kirsty could resist. Hurrying the little girl along, she rounded the corner. In a moment, Ellen was beside her. They walked quickly, not speaking. Kirsty between them toward the large apartment buildings where both families lived. When they were almost home, Ellen whispered suddenly, I was so scared. Me too, Anne-Marie whispered back. As they turned to enter their building, both girls looked straight ahead toward the door. They did it purposely so that they would not catch the eyes or the attention of two more soldiers who stood with their guns on this corner as well. Kirsty scurried ahead of them through the door, chattering about the picture she was bringing home from kindergarten to show Mama. For Kirsty, the soldiers were simply part of the landscape, something that had always been there on every corner, as unimportant as lampposts through her remembered life. Are you going to tell your mother? Ellen asked Anne Marie as they trudged together up the stairs. I'm not. My mother would be upset. No, I won't either. Mama would probably scold me for running on the street. She said goodbye to Ellen on the second floor where Ellen lived and continued on to the third, practicing in her mind a cheerful greeting for her mother. A smile, a description of today's spelling test in which she had done well. But it was too late. Kirsty had gotten there first. Now what do you suppose Kirsty's going to say about what happened on the corner? Share that with your fellow listener. And he poked Anne-Marie's book bag with his gun, and then he grabbed my hair. Kirsty was chattering as she took off her sweater in the center of the apartment living room. But I wasn't scared. Anne-Marie was, and Ellen too, but not me. Mrs. Johansson rose quickly from the chair by the window where she'd been sitting. Mrs. Rosen, Ellen's mother, was there too in the opposite chair. They'd been having coffee together, as they did many afternoons. Of course, it wasn't real coffee though the mother still called it that, having coffee. There had been no real coffee in Copenhagen since the beginning of the Nazi occupation, not even any real tea. The mother sipped at hot water, flavored with herbs. Anne Marie, what happened? What is Kirsty talking about? Her mother asked anxiously. Where's Ellen? Mrs. Rosen had a frightened look. Ellen's in your apartment. She didn't realize you were here, Anne Marie explained. Don't worry. It wasn't anything. It was the two soldiers who stand on the corner of Osterbrogate. They've, you've seen them. You know the tall one with the long neck, the one who looks like a silly giraffe, she told her mother and Mrs. Rosen of the incident, trying to make it sound humorous and unimportant. But their uneasy looks didn't change. I slapped his hand and shouted at him, Kirsty announced importantly. Uh, no, no, she didn't. No, she didn't, Mama. Anne-Marie reassured her mother. She's exaggerating, as she always does. Mrs. Johansson moved to the window and looked down to the street below. The Copenhagen neighborhood was quiet. It looked the same as always. People coming and going from the shops, children at play, the soldiers on the corner. 
She spoke in a low voice to Ellen's mother. They must be edgy because of the latest resistance incidents. Did you read in De Fradunks about the bombings in Hillrod and Norbro? Although she pretended to be absorbed in unpacking her school books, and Marie listened, and she knew what her mother was referring to. The De Free Dansk, which means the Free Danes, was an illegal newspaper. Peter Nielsen brought it to them occasionally, carefully folded and hidden among ordinary books and papers and Mama always burned it after she and Papa had read it. But Anne-Marie heard Mama and Papa talk sometimes at night about the news they received that way, news of sabotage against the Nazis, bombs hidden and exploded in the factories that produced war materials, and industrial railroad lines damaged so that the goods couldn't be transported. And she knew what resistance meant. Papa had explained when she overheard the word and asked. The resistance fighters were Danish people, no one knew who because they were very secret, who were determined to bring harm to the Nazis, however they could. They damaged the German trucks and cars and bombed their factories. They were very brave. Sometimes they were caught and killed. I must go and speak to Ellen, Mrs. Rosen said, moving toward the door. You girls walk a different way to school tomorrow. Promise me, Anne-Marie, and Ellen will promise too. We will, Mrs. Rosen, but what does it matter? There are German soldiers on every corner. They will remember your faces, Mrs. Rosen said, turning in the doorway to the hall. It is important to be one of the crowd always. Be one of many. Be sure that they never have reason to remember your face. She disappeared into the hall and closed the door behind her. He'll remember my face, Mama, Kirsty announced happily, because he and I look like his little girl. He said I look like his little girl. He said I was pretty. If he has such a pretty little girl, why doesn't he go back to her like a good father? Mrs. Johansson murmured, stroking Kirsty's cheek. Why doesn't he go back to his own country? Mama, is there anything to eat? Anne-Marie asked, hoping to take her mother's mind from the soldiers. Take some bread and give a piece to your sister. With butter? Kirsty asked hopefully. No butter, her mother replied. You know that. Kirsty sighed. As Anne Marie went to the bread box in the kitchen. I wish I could have a cupcake, she said. A big yellow cupcake with pink frosting. Her mother laughed. For a little girl, you have a long memory, she told Kirsty. There hasn't been any butter or sugar for cupcakes for a long time, a year at least. When will there be cupcakes again? When the war ends, Mrs. Johansson said. She glanced through the window, down to the street corner where the soldiers stood, their faces impassive beneath the metal helmets. When the soldiers leave. Tell me a story, Anne-Marie, begged Kirsty as she snuggled beside her sister in the big bed they shared. Tell me a fairy tale. Anne-Marie smiled and wrapped her arms around her little sister in the dark. All Danish children grew up familiar with fairy tales. Hans Christian Andersen, the most famous of the tale-tellers, had been Danish himself. Do you want the one about the little mermaid? That one had always been Anne-Marie's own favorite. But Kirsty said no. Tell one that starts with a king and a queen, and they have a beautiful daughter. All right, once upon a time there was a king, Anne-Marie began. And a queen, whispered Kirsty. Don't forget the queen. And a queen. They lived together in a wonderful palace and... Was the palace named Amelia Bor? Kirsty asked sleepily. Shh, don't keep interrupting or I'll never finish the story. No, it wasn't Amelia Bor. It was a pretend palace. Anne-Marie talked on, making up a story of a king and queen and their beautiful daughter, Princess Kirsten. She sprinkled her tail with former, formal uh, dances, fabulous gold-trimmed gowns, and feasts of pink-frosted cupcakes, until Kirsty's deep, even breathing told her that her sister was sound asleep. She stopped, waited for a moment, half expecting Kirsty to murmur, Then what happened? Kirsty was still. Anne-Marie's thoughts turned to the real king, Christian X, 
and the real palace Emilienborg where he lived in the center of Copenhagen. How the people of Denmark loved King Christian. He was not like fairy tale kings who seemed to stand on balconies giving orders to his subjects or who sat on golden thrones demanding to be entertained and looking for suitable husbands for their daughters. King Christian was a real human being, a man with a serious, kind face. She had seen him often when she was younger. Each morning he had come from the palace on his horse, Jubilee, and hidden alone through the streets of Copenhagen, greeting his people. Sometimes he had waved back to the two of them and smiled. Now you are special forever, Lisa had told her once, because you have been greeted by a king. Do you agree that a person is special because someone famous like a king greets that person? Share your opinion with your fellow listener. And now moments more for today of Number the Stars. Anne-Marie turned her head on the pillow and stared through the partly open curtains of the window into the dim September night, thinking of Lisa, her solemn lovely sister, always made her sad. So she turned her thoughts again to the king who was still alive, as Lisa was not. We'll find out more what happens in Number the Stars as this saga continues.